And of course, I spoke about when we breathe too much, we offload carbon dioxide, we get rid of carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide, not just a waste gas. One of the functions of carbon dioxide, it plays a role in pH. So normal pH of the blood is 7.365, and if pH is too acidic and drops to below 6.8, or if it's too alkaline and it rises above 7.8, cells die, death can result. So the function of carbon dioxide is to maintain pH within very tightly defined parameters. And in the blood, carbon dioxide forms bicarbonate through the following reaction. So we have carbon dioxide and water forming, dissociating into carbonic acid. And in turn, they dissociate into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate, HCO3 minus. So carbon dioxide dissociates, and this is constituting a major alkaline buffer which resists changes in acidity. So by breathing too much, we offload carbon dioxide. And as a result, we're left with an excess of bicarbonate ion and a deficiency of hydrogen ion. And the loss of hydrogen ion, it shifts the pH in a more alkaline direction. But the body, of course, the blood wants to always bring it back to 7.365. If overbreathing is just for a short period of time, when breathing starts to decreasing towards normal levels, that allows carbon dioxide to accumulate and it helps to restore carbon dioxide, and of course, pH. However, if we're over breathing for hours to days, we're still left with a situation that we have too little hydrogen ion and too much bicarbonate, that there's an excess of bicarbonate to hydrogen ion. But of course, the body wants to restore pH back to normal. It doesn't want respiratory alkalosis. Um, and the way to do that is then that the kidneys step in and the kidneys then will dump bicarbonate. Okay, so by the kidneys dumping bicarbonate, now we're left with a situation of chronic hyperventilation because we're left with a situation of low hydrogen ion, low bicarbonate, and that's our buffer. Our buffer has reduced. So hypocapnia, which is lower CO2 and pH shift, they're almost immediate. You know, if you start taking 10, 12 big breaths in and out, um, of your mouth, you will lower carbon dioxide in the lungs very, very quickly, and in a couple of minutes, carbon dioxide in the blood will start to reduce, so it's quite quick. However, if we're breathing too much over a period of days, that's when the kidneys will step in to bring pH back to normal, because pH is critical to the maintenance of the human body. You know, pH is, is a fundamental function. Normal, having normal pH is very, very important. So hydrogen ion and bicarbonate, so basically bicarbonate is dumped by the kidneys, so the bicarbonate is sacrificed to maintain pH back to normal. But when we lose bicarbonate, and then we're stuck in a state of chronic hyperventilation. So thus the chronic hyperventilator's pH regulation, it's finely balanced. Diminished acid, which is the consequence of hyperventilation, is balanced by a low level of blood bicarbonate, which is maintained by the, the kidneys. And in this equilibrium, small amounts of overbreathing induced by emotion can cause large falls of carbon dioxide and consequently more symptoms. Because when the individual has reached a state of chronic hyperventilation, as I said already, they have low hydrogen ion and they have low bicarbonate. So they're always teetering on the brink of symptoms. So it doesn't take much just to push them over. And it would be like, say, for example, somebody coming in to me with panic attacks. They come in, they sit down, I look at their breathing, they sigh, they have their mouth open, they have noticeable breathing. And that means to me that their normal breathing is incorrect. Their breathing is too much. When that individual gets into their car and they're driving along a highway, for example, and there's trucks passing them by, they get stressed. And as they get stressed, they start breathing too much. However, they don't have much of a cushion to offset this increase of breathing. In other words, they're constantly teetering on the brink of symptoms. So the individual who's driving, breathing too much, as their breathing volume increases, they offload carbon dioxide. And this in turn, as we're gonna see later, causes the carotid arteries to constrict. So basically, 
the main blood flow to the brain can constrict due to overbreathing. Now we have a situation that the individual who's susceptible to panic attacks has got reduced blood flow and as a result reduced oxygen going to the brain. The brain then gets excited, stimulates the person to even breathe harder and of course this completes the vicious circle, they go into a panic attack. The issue wasn't the stress on the highway. The issue was the person's everyday breathing because it was too much. They had developed a habit of over breathing and this is maintained by renal excretion, by the kidneys dumping the bicarbonate. In order to help the individual with a panic attack, a short-term measure would have been maybe that they use a brown paper bag to help rebreathe in CO2 to normalize their CO2 levels to get more blood flow to help open up, you know, to improve their blood circulation and also to cause more oxygen to be released to the brain to calm the individual down. However, a more permanent solution is change their everyday breathing, improve their everyday breathing. And that's what we will be looking at later on. So another function of carbon dioxide, again, now you'll start to see that it's not just a waste gas at all. Um, that here is what's called the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. So you can imagine that when we breathe, um, we carry air from the atmosphere and oxygen passes into the small air sacs in the lungs and this then passes into the blood where it's picked up by haemoglobin and haemoglobin has an iron ion at its core and basically each haemoglobin carries four units of oxygen so oxygen itself it doesn't dissolve very well in the blood the blood will only carry a small amount of oxygen dissolved in it so it relies on haemoglobin as the carrier of oxygen so haemoglobin allows up to 70 times more oxygen to be carried than what otherwise would have been. So you can imagine now that you have the carrier of oxygen is the haemoglobin, and as soon as then as the haemoglobin then, okay, the blood has been pumped um, from the heart around to the cells to, to release oxygen to the cells. When we have a decrease of carbon dioxide, if we're breathing too much, there's a decrease of CO2. As a result, this drops pH. And in terms of the oxygen dissociation curve, it causes the curve to shift to the left. Now what that means is that for a given amount of, of oxygen, when the curve shifts to the left, the bond between oxygen and the red blood cells are, is strengthened. Now I'll say that again. So in terms of the oxygen dissociation curve, if we look at the normal, the black curve, that's normal. So for a given amount, say for example, if we say there's a given amount of oxygen, which is 50, and I bring it up to the normal curve and I bring it over, I'm getting a saturation of haemoglobin with oxygen of approximately 82. So 82% is the saturation of um, haemoglobin with oxygen. Now, if for example, we are breathing too much and we're losing carbon dioxide, and that in turn then is dropping pH, the curve shifts to the left. And when the curve shifts to the left, it means that the bond between oxygen and the red blood cells, between oxygen and the haemoglobin strengthens. So in other words, the catalyst for the release of oxygen from the red blood cells is carbon dioxide. But if we're breathing too much, we're losing carbon dioxide, that causes the bond between oxygen and haemoglobin strengthen. So oxygen isn't released so readily. So back to our 50. So here we have our, the amount of oxygen here is 50, and now the curve is shifted to the left because of the loss of carbon dioxide. So for a given level of oxygen, if I move over, now it's showing that the oxyhemoglobin percentage saturation is about 88%. Now what that means is that the haemoglobin has held onto oxygen more readily. Because oxygen is all very well in the blood, but you know, Ideally, we want it being delivered from the blood to the cells. And the catalyst for the release of oxygen from the blood to the cells is carbon dioxide and an increase in body temperature. Now, on the other hand, say we're doing physical exercise with normal breathing. Or, for example, we're applying the exercise, the breathing exercise that we will do later on. As we slow down our breathing, it allows carbon dioxide to gently accumulate. As we increase our metabolic activity, as for example during physical exercise, we generate more carbon dioxide. That in turn causes a right shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. 
So for a given amount of oxygen, when the curve shifts to the right, in this situation with 50, I move over, now that I'm in a situation of the oxyhemoglobin that's saturation, is about 72%. In other words, the blood has offloaded oxygen. So ironically, for modern man, and of course woman, to get more oxygen to deliver to the cells, our breathing should be light. If our breathing is heavy, we're losing carbon dioxide, and the curve shifts to the left, and the bond between hemoglobin and oxygen strengthens. So that's not what we want. And looking at it, you know, from this point of view, I have two arms. You know, in terms of if I was moving one arm and I'm physically working it, it makes sense that the muscles and the cells in my right arm are going to require oxygen. So how do those cells encourage oxygen to be released to them? Well, basically, the more that you do physical exercise, the hotter they get, and also there's carbon dioxide produced. And those are the catalysts for the release of oxygen from the red blood cells. Now, I know it's a little bit complicated. pH, all you have to remember is that, yes, carbon dioxide is not just a waste gas. It performs some very, very important functions in the human body. One is the maintenance of normal pH. Normal pH in the blood is 7.365. If it drops to below 6.8, we can die. If it goes to alkaline to 7.8, we die. And the primary function of carbon dioxide is to help maintain it within normal. A second factor of carbon dioxide is that it's the catalyst for the release of oxygen from the red blood cells. If we breathe too much, there's less oxygen delivered to the cells. A third factor is that hyperventilation can cause constriction of the, the carotid arteries. So breathing too much and also of course because how does it do this? Well we have smooth muscle embedded in the blood vessels and when we breathe too much and we lose carbon dioxide the smooth muscle constricts. But there's also smooth muscle of course embedded in the airways. So breathing too much to lose carbon dioxide also causes the airways to constrict and that can manifest as, for example, bronchoconstriction as found in asthma. So it's a primary response to hyperventilation. It can reduce the amount of oxygen available to the brain by half. So breathing too much can literally reduce the amount of oxygen quite significantly. This makes sense in terms of our stress. Earlier on, we spoke about stress and I said, yes, when we get stressed, you know, our breathing gets faster, it becomes more noticeable, we often breathe through the mouth, and then we can't think straight. And that's normal, because think of it this way. If stress is increasing our breathing, and if a response from increased breathing is to reduce the amount of oxygen reaching the brain, of course we can't think straight. So as a student, I remember going into one final exam, and I was quite anxious about the exam. This was in university. And I took a walk before the exam and I started taking big breaths in the whole belief that it was beneficial for me. I ended up going into the exam dizzy. I couldn't think straight. So here you have a situation that I was unknowingly taking big breaths in an attempt to calm down. And all I was doing was depriving my brain of oxygen. And the very time that I needed to have alertness, I just didn't have it. And you can imagine the amount of people with anxiety, with stress, with depression, who are taking deep breaths, big breaths, to try and calm down, and in actual fact, it's having the opposite effect.